This is a letter about Dr. Muir. Since leaving Sir John Talbot, I have had the honor of serving in the West Indies for some time during the late contest with America and at three different ships with Captain Frederick Maidley, an officer whose name stands conspicuously forward in the records of British gallantry and whose talents were eminently displayed by the successful manner in which he blockaded Napoleon in July 1815 with a force that, in less able hands, would have been totally inadequate to such a service. I remained with this excellent officer until I was directed to accompany Napoleon to St. Helena in the manner already stated. Captain Maitland's opinion of my conduct and character will be seen by a perusal of the following letters to Dr. Harness. November 5th, 1814. Dear Sir, the attention and meritorious conduct of Mr. Barry O'Meara, while surgeant with me in the Goliath, calls upon me as an act of justice to him and a benefit to the service to the state that during 15 years I have commanded some one of His Majesty's ships. I have never had the pleasure of sailing with an officer in his situation who so fully met my expectations. Not being a judge of his professional abilities, though, I have every reason to believe them of the first class. I know that to be the opinion of some of the oldest and most respectable surgeons in the Navy. I shall only state that during a period of very bad weather, which occasioned the Goliath to be extremely sickly, his attention and tenderness to the men was such as to call forth my warmest approbation, and the grateful affection of both officers and men were it probable that I should soon obtain another appointment. I know of no man in the service I should wish to have as surgeon so much as Mr. O'Meara, as however in the present state of the war, that is not likely. I trust you'll do me the favor of giving him an appointment as an encouragement to young men of his description. And believe me, dear sir, with much respect, yours most sincerely, Frederick L. Maitland. I feel that some further apology is necessary for all these details, but when the nature of the attack made on all that a man should cherish and esteem in society is considered, I rely with confidence rather on the sympathy than disapprobation of the public for thus endeavoring to render myself that justice, which has been repeatedly denied to me in other quarters, although it is, I trust, unnecessary to make any very detailed reply to the author's diabolical attempt to identify me with a person of the same name mentioned in the secret history of the cabinet of St. Cloud. As a person of the French government in Ireland, I am particularly anxious that the mode and manner of making the above charge should be carefully examined by every lover of justice, and in the event of the author's not coming forward to disavow the accuracy of his self-evident insinuations, I shall consider myself bound to follow the advice of those who have recommended the adoption of legal measures for the more perfect justification of my character and punishment of the offender. Had this attack not been intended as a cool and deliberate effort to destroy my reputation, the writer would surely have taken the trouble of asking those who furnished him with his other facts what my probable age might be, in which case, even such a writer as I have been called upon to answer, would not have considered a boy of 12 years old and occupied in learning the first rudiments of his education as a likely person to act either in the capacity of a spy or partisan. In page 62, I am an accused of an intimacy with Mr. Lewis Solomon, an intimacy with a tradesman, who I have every reason to believe a most respectable character. It is rather an extraordinary crime for an Englishman to be accused and other of, allowing it to be the fact, which however is not the case, my intimacy with Mr. Lewis Solomon only consisted in my having frequently purchased articles in his shop and paying him for them whenever he sent in his bill. Furnishing newspapers for my private amusement at Longwood is also, I suppose, considered to be a heinous offense, as it is printed in capitals. The truth is that until the month of May or June 1818, I never saw more than one number of the anti Gallican in St. Helena, as stated in a former page. At that time, I saw several numbers of this paper in Mr. Solomon's shop, which had been just returned to him from Sir Thomas Reed, to whom Mr. Solomon had lent them. 
I borrowed a few of these and begged some more, which he could not accommodate me with, as he informed me. They were first promised to the adjutant general, as if the above pretended intimacy was a crime of the first magnitude, upon which something very important depended. The author links, thinks he has fully proved it by a long story relative to a snuff box which Napoleon was desirous of presenting to Mr. Boyce, one of the island's chaplains, in testimony of his attending the remains of Mr. Cipriani to the grave. Much has been already said on this subject. I consider myself bound, therefore, to trespass on the reader's indulgence by relating the facts in the way they really occurred. And I have no doubt the gentleman whose name has been thus brought forward to public notice, will not refuse to corroborate them if called on for that purpose. But in every case, the candid and impartial will know how to appreciate the motives which could have induced the author and his friends to attach such wonderful consequences to this insignificant affair. Mr. Cipriani had been attended in the illness which caused his death by Mr. Baxter and Mr. Henry of the 66, in addition to myself, after his demise, General Montalon was desirous of testifying the high sense entertained of their conduct by the French and requested me to purchase something handsome in the town for the purpose of being presented to them, as I had assured him that I was convinced any fees for professional attendance would be refused by both. Accordingly, I purchased from Mr. Lewis Solomon a silver breakfast set for each, and a day or two afterwards informed Mr. Baxter at Plantation House of General Montalon's intentions, and that the present would be sent to his house in a short time. Three days afterwards, Mr. Baxter informed me that he had consulted Sir Thomas Lowe upon the subject, and that he should be obliged to decline receiving it. He therefore begged of me to prevent its being sent to him. No intimation whatsoever was made to me either by Mr. Baxter or Sir Hudson Lowe of there being any impropriety in my serving as a channel for these little presents.